So um, I want to talk here a little bit about um, some of the challenge in testing. It's not as specific about the Quagga project. It's more about testing in general. As I assume, most of you are more into coding and sometimes maybe completely unaware what it takes on the testing side. Uh, just a quick intro. Uh, open source routing, that's what I work on. It's a project of NetDev. That's NetDev with F, not with a V, like this conference. Uh, which is Network Device Education Foundation. We are a non-profit in the California base there. My name is Martin Winter. I'm one of the co-founders of NetDev. Um, I mainly focus on testing in Quagga, and I mainly do that because obviously nobody else wants to do testing. I used to work for a large ISP a long time back. I always complained to the equipment vendor how the stuff is broken, it never worked. Then they hired me. I complained there too many times, they nearly fired me. Then uh, I placed in other places, but in general, testing is a horrible job as an employee because most people will blame you for like holdups and breaking things, and you're never the good person. The developer is always the good person in general, the tester is the bad one. It's much better than open source, I have to say, and I really appreciate the open source community, which are normally much more open and listening on mistakes. Just a quick intro for the ones who don't know what Quagga is. Not that relevant because I'm just using as an example. Uh, Quagga is a routing stack. Uh, up there, that's the picture of a Quagga. If you have never seen, it's a project named after an, ex after an extinct animal. It's a great naming scheme. Um, so it's routing protocols, RIP, RIP, NG, OSPF, ISIS, BGP, PIM, and stuff there. And it also runs on multiple platforms. It's not just a Linux project. It runs on various BSDs and even Solaris and probably a few other things. It's used on very low-end platforms too, from like which is interesting also in the testing and optimization, because it runs on very low-end things like OpenWT, small boxes, to like high-end SDN cloud boxes, virtual things, and even distributed routers. It originally came from Zebra. It was like forked off when Zebra started to be closed. So was there, it was uh, forked off at that time. It's on the GPL v2. It's also a true community project in the sense that there isn't really an organization behind who controls or has a final say. It's basically spread out across multiple organizations, coordinated through mailing lists. Yeah. So, um, just to give you a quick background before I go in, because you're wondering many times why is it done so complicated. There are obviously a few drawbacks when I do the testing, which I can't really control. So there is, like I say, it's a true community project. There isn't really a clear owner. There isn't a company who says like, we do it this way or we change that thing. It's all discussed through mailing lists with sometimes quite slow on like how to do things. There is also a quite simple Git model. There is like a main source, it's on Savannah, which is one of the public Git hosters. There, it's mostly a single master branch with a few branches sometimes now, every few months with the commits coming in from development things. And also quite essential, the submissions are based by emails these days. There are discussions about doing with Git merges and other things, but today it's mainly people fix something, they send that patch to the mailing list, and the whole code review and discussions are on the mailing list based on these email submissions. So these are basically the things I have to work with to start testing. Now, obviously, these days, everyone talks about continuous integration and the testbed. And there are all these fancy tools and tons more. There are like Jenkins, very famous there. There are tons of other ones hosted and everyone has these great tools and we have the perfect system. I learned one thing very fast. They all assume your, your project is purely Linux and you can run a Java client on all the executor things. The purely Linux and Java, basically that basically means it's not really cross-platform. Yes, I was Looking at it, Jenkins and Atlassian Bamboo are tested a lot there. Their Java clients isn't really that multi-platform. There is basically running it on things like a NetBSD and other places is sometimes not that easy or not possible at all. Stability is another issue. 
Jenkins, I really like it. It has really cool, um, amazing features, uh, way more features than some of the other things, except I couldn't find a single version which actually worked. They are really good on fixing bugs as well, I have to say, because every bug I found, I found the next version or the previous versions didn't have that bug, but it had a different bug. So, and at that time I was wondering like, well, I probably shouldn't spend all my time on Jenkins because obviously I have to work, do some of the real project on it, the one I'm testing it. So I ended up with Atlassian Bamboo, which is half closed source. I mean, they do open source and they're also free for non-profit. Discussion always comes about hosting things. Uh, doesn't work that easy for me because a lot of things which I go later in requires dedicated tester hardware. So a lot of my testing isn't just pure software. It takes complete topology simulated and uh, bring up that with testing equipment. There, which also, and also some of them runs a long time, which some of the hosted ones may not be capable to do. So how does my CI run look as a quick overview? It's very simple. There are some people uh, post a patch. We use a tool Patchwork, which you may or may not be familiar with it. It's a tool which lists, monitors mailing lists. It picks up then the patches and puts in the database. It does a clever enough to Notice that if there are a whole series based on the subject a little bit that you can like guess on it if it's not just a single patch that, but a series. So I go pick that out and try to apply it just against the last ma master because on mailing list nobody tells me against what the patch is so I just have to guess unfortunately. I have to say in about 30% of the cases that's the wrong guess and it just fa fails to apply. On the other side, I have to say that's fine by me because people will know immediately it's broken and they probably submit it again or they will mention that. Then after that, simple thing, which I say, show at the bottom a little bit how long it takes. It's about two minutes on a single virtual machine, just applying and repackaging it. Then I send it out to all the different OSs which I'm running. In case you not, cannot read it, I'm currently testing it on Ubuntu 12. 14.04, CentOS 6, CentOS 7, Debian 8, FreeBSD 8, FreeBSD 9, FreeBSD 10, NetBSD 6, NextBSD 7, OpenBSD 5.8, and OmniOS, which is one of the open Solaris derivatives. They all basically, they are compiled in parallel. I try to go through the whole compiling, see if there are any compiling mistakes. Uh, one thing I learned is most people submitting patches, they only play with Linux most likely even only just their version of Linux and it may not even work on different distribution. I'm also building packages for it, trying to do it. There are more test packages to see how they work and I check that too. And I'm running also the unit tests, which are some Deja GNU tests for like uh, all the pa on all platforms. That takes about another 10 minutes, runs on 12 virtual machines, basically one per operating system in parallel. After that, I'm going to find out, like, want to see, like, do the routing protocols work at all or something. So I don't have the much time, too much time, basically, to do a full check, but I want to do a quick check. So I'm trying to bring up each routing protocol just once, see does it, like, work or something, which are the basic tests there, which I say that takes about one hour for IPv4 or IPv6 going through a few different configurations. So I configure them, I run basically three, four tests out of my compliance test suite. So th is that test suite written, written, by, written by you? Uh, I'm getting into the details uh, on that one afterwards, but uh, that is, it's a good question actually. Short answer is yes. <laughs> the, no, the short answer is no, it should not. <laughs> um, the, I'm also running uh, Clang, the Clang basic for static analyzer which is a very interesting approach. I'm not sure anyone else uses it in automated because running it is simple. I haven't really figured out what to do with the results. I'm pushing it out as part of all the test results there, but trying to go back to a classic pass failure scenario, I haven't really figured out what to do with it. It's also after this stage basically, which is somewhere about an hour, 15 minutes, 
I'm basically generating email reply back, which goes to the list to the submitter, which basically gets back to immediately say like pa your stuff passed, it basically compiled and all that basic test uh, passed, or no, it failed and with the summaries on it. I'll go into detail too. And then once I have all these things, then I may go to the full compliance test. I have a dotted line because that's currently manual kickoff. I don't run that automatically. Everything else runs automatically when somebody sends an e a patch to the mailing list. So this one takes like uh, two days at, and I require a total of 48 virtual machines to run that thing for two days. So that's about the challenge there. With. Now a bit more details, as I mentioned already, check out. So it's really interesting. If your project uses all with Git and merge requests, you basically know quite easy where it applies to. Obviously, you may still want to push something on where it's applied that you don't want people to send patches on very old versions. They should. It's normally better for the origin submitter that he has it based on the latest like code there, latest nightly or whatever it is, latest like master branch or something there. Uh, in my case, so I just pull the latest master, I say then I apply the patches, I try to guess if it's a single patch or if he sent out 3, 10, 20 patches who all depend on each other. Uh, was challenging a little bit, I noticed that most people are good enough to use the get send email feature which all give the base same message ID and subjects like with the numbering up so I can do quite a good guess which seems to work in over 90% of the cases to like actually guess the whole series and apply in a correct sequence. And after the patching basically I just pack it up but also add some extra information on there with like the reference there from the git thing. Then packaging what I'm doing here, basically, I'm running that all in virtual machines, which I start and shut down on demand. The, um, that gives me the nice thing that I can basically have a snapshot where I can clean reset it at the beginning. I don't worry about things corrupting or something. I just, before I start up, reset everything to a clean snapshot with nothing on it and then build it. The next big challenge is obviously configuring it, especially a project like Quarka has a lot of configure options. Um, I have to make guesses. I try to make guesses which are common, but most likely maybe not the same as everyone else. There's at least one company who frequently submit things, they use different configure options, and I notice that frequently it passes in their version, but it fails in mine. Um, I go to the make unit tests. I have to say, unfortunately, I assume in many other projects that are quite weak, um, people don't seem to like to write tests. They don't write unit tests or anything either, so there are, it's a small set of it, unfortunately. I wish that would get a bit better there somewhere. And after I run the unit tests, I basically run the full packaging building again. Uh, protocol checks. So I'm not sure how much of you are, how many of you are into routing protocols, but they're all based on these RFC test uh, checks. There is also obviously things you have to keep in mind. The RFCs are sometimes not that clearly written. People disagree on how to read them. There are also sometimes where people wrote an RFC and then they figured out maybe that's not the right thing, so they bring an updated version, which could be just a draft, not even a full standard, but everyone implements it. Or it could be a new standard which disagrees on some features, reverses things, and then potentially a newer version again which disagrees again. So you never have all the things passing. You basically do a test and you assume that some of them pass. I'm looking more at the history of what passed, and if things change, like suddenly fails, that's for me a bad thing. The same thing when I do just a few selected things, I just want to hear in this basic things, make sure the protocols come up there. I'll go into detail a bit afterwards there. Also the static analyzer, as I said, I have no idea what to do with the results today. If someone of you has some suggestion, please approach me afterwards. I would love to hear because I can run it. I have this fancy like output there, but how to pass it, how to make that in a pass fail and have a 
simple email or something back to the person who sent it, I don't know yet. I say after that, I want to send out an email quick. I don't want to wait days. The idea is really, I want, if somebody sends a patch, I want him to give him a feedback as fast as possible. Because if it's broken, it's most likely the best way to get fixed if he gets a feedback very soon. And also, obviously, in the email, I can't just give him the cryptic output of my test tools. I have to make it as simple as space and easy to understand as possible. So I have just a few quick, I'm not sure you can read it, about successful tests, which basically just give him feedback here. I tested it. This is the patch I tested, where it was like on Patchwork Archived. I tell him where you can get the full information with all the details from the test run there too, and say like, hey, thank you, successful. It could be things where it's failed compiling. I may say like, hey, the patching worked, but then when I tried to compile, as an example, it worked on all the different Linuxes, but on FreeBSD, here in this case, basically, it failed. There's always a tons of if defs that are based on BSD. Again, I try to extract small things, make it as simple to read as possible. It could be also things like where the full protocol stuff in the routing protocol didn't work. Here I have a classic example too. Um, there, which is, I go into more details from the compliance test but afterwards, but I may just get back here, here, I didn't expect some packets, so in this case it's like BGP, an update, and the packet wasn't forwarded as it was supposed to do afterwards. So it either ignored the update or someone else, or something else went wrong. So compliance check is an interesting thing. I'm on the theory that the person who writes the code or in routing protocol shouldn't be necessarily the person who writes the test because people may disagree and you want to have another opinion. I talked to many other projects in the routing space and asked them what they're using. In general, nothing. But besides Quagga, everyone I talked to, they may test against the Cisco or the Juniper or multiple ones and against them, their own code. and see if they can bring a few things up and if it works that's good enough that obviously is not good enough in what i see it because you need to figure out bad status too what happens if i get bad packet stuff if you're not familiar especially bgp bgp has these issues that packets updates can be transitive which means that even if you don't cannot pass all the details or something you are supposed to forward it basically the same update going on to the next person so you have frequently these outages in the internet where <coughs> somebody sends a bad update and everyone else ignores it but just forwards it on. And then somewhere else around the world, like other routers from one vendor, like break because they receive all these bad updates and they don't know how to deal with it. So you have to go through the whole thing. Um, it's also sometimes not a consistent. So I usually have to run it multiple times. That's unfortunate there. And again, I say it takes between three and 30 hours per routing protocol for my tests to run currently. The nice thing on this one is also, it's not just testing like compliance. <coughs> the test bed, what I'm using is like, it basically uses the CLI to configure the route of each test. Basically goes in, configures it for a specific setup, runs the test and removes the config and changes to a different configuration. So I noticed that at least half of the failures I find are configuration things because it does heavy configuration changes and like going from one way to another one. And I'm on purpose not restarting the demons between the tests. People ask me sometimes, could I parallel, uh, run it more parallel? I could, but I'm missing the mistakes where sometimes a state gets messed up from one test and impacts the test later. So I decided not to do that at this time. It's also another challenge, especially with commercial things, like how much can you share? And in general for compliance tests, the secret, what as an example Ixia told me, isn't really, uh, it's basically how they do the test. So the exact protocol which for each RFC compliance, what they do exactly and in what sequence, I'm not allowed to share, unfortunately. Big disadvantage from running commercial test suites. 
unfortunately there is nothing really open source there. There is some attempts in BGP, there is absolutely nothing I know of in ISIS or OSPF or any of these other protocols. But I basically create some summary which gives some in indication. I can list which RFC broker and I can give some details in there. I'm also creating PDF reports which I then go and publish on more or less frequent intervals there too. The other essential thing, if you're doing something like that, I strongly suggest put all the information, everything back into a database. So I have an uh, SQL database with every test run I ever run in there from the compliance with the full PCAPs, logs, and everything else there, so I can go back. I also have to say you have the full information also from something classic like a Cisco because things fail and sometimes you're wondering what does Cisco do? And I can compare and see like, oh, Cisco fails the same way, then maybe that's something people disagree on that standard and I should not worry about it. There are also, also lots of places when obviously other companies like Cisco are not running that well. And I had frequently the comments too that people look at Quagga, they see my test reports and they see all these failed results and they think it's not so good quality. And I can only say that now if I would publish the Cisco results, you wouldn't would think completely different. <laughs> but I'm not publishing them because they don't pay me and I don't want to deal with them talking about all the issues. I'm actually also from the full compliance test, I'm running it, basically this I'm running in a virtual machine. I'm only running currently on Ubuntu uh, right now, uh, because obviously from the amount of the 48 virtual machines requiring about 30 hours of runtime, I'm a bit limited. I'm currently working on having the same test done with FreeBSD 10 as well, just so I have a complete different OS. Uh, I'm not done yet with that one, but I have initial runs yet. I still need to go through the failures to see what that is. <coughs> I'm also do protocol fuzzing, um, which basically means this is like I'm using a, again a commercial appliance which knows all the protocols. It goes through all the protocol fields, tries to skip fields, essential ones. It tries to have values which are out of range. It tries to do all these other things that are like trying to go there. Unfortunately, runtimes is going into the ridiculous. It's one to two weeks in case there are no issues found. I have seen where it took two months of runtime because it tried to narrow down on some of the issues. So it's a big challenge on how to, uh, what to do there. I'm also not publishing the results there because I have two issues there, either it all passes and it's just boring to say like it's all perfect or it doesn't pass and then it's most likely a security issue and I may not want to publish it until it's fixed and then it's boring again. And then as last I'm also doing some scale performance tests. This one I'm really struggling still to having full automated. Mainly think about that you have physical testing hardware, which I have like Ixia and Spare Test Center, they frequently I have to run with uh, Tickle and stuff there, so I have random different scripting languages mixing together. Uh, it takes automation, I'm not able to run all the things at the same time because it's so much testing hardware that I just can't afford even to run the power. So I have scripts which turn things on and off the power, physical power on demand, because it's also on physical machines. Um, I build complete network topologies, which you can use an open flow switch. In my case, I'm using some Cisco switches, if you want to know details there, because they're much cheaper. Uh, I'm using some undocumented features on some Cisco switches to make them into a patch panel. But again, it goes down into pass-fail criteria too, which I don't really know how to answer that on scale and performance there. I'm um, happy to talk about more in details there. And then basically that's more or less the end of it. I should have five minutes left because I was five minutes late to start. So we have time, a few questions. But I mean, the key thing is I want to give an overview how or what I'm doing it, just for you to think a little bit about it. If you're into testing too, I would love to exchange some ideas because 
most companies, groups and stuff I approach it, the answer was always we don't do anything. And that's not good enough in my opinion. So I would love to exchange a little bit of ideas. I'm very open there. If you want to talk about it, if uh, discuss why I'm doing things and not the other way around, I can explain that things or anything else. If you want to help out, if you're interested on Quark specifically, I'm open to it. Yeah? So if after two days you found that there was a bug, yes. the patch actually introduced a bug, is it reverting you just sending an email, is there any policy? Or uh, normally, so that's the two days, that's the full compliance. That's a not, I'm not doing that all the time, but yes, I normally, because the problem is that I can't really publish the exact, because of the commercial things, that the exact details how it is. I normally approach the person who wrote it. Uh, so if, I'm run, if I know which commit it was, then it's quite easy. I can approach that person. If not, I work with a few people trying to nail down. I may come back and I w have my own written test tools and other things to simulate it. And I may post it back there here with a small C program with some library here. It's how to reproduce the issues where you can see the whole thing. So I normally write basically a small test things around it or somehow or find out how it's done. Sometimes it's easy, it's com uh, configuration st statements. I see. So, so you're not treated now as a gatekeeper, right? So it may be that uh, someone submitted patches that may introduce some bug. And it may be, I say, like a few days later, there may be a few other patches in the meantime too. Especially because it takes so long, I cannot really automate it completely. So it's something which I'm working on, it's seeing if there's a better way to have that fully automated or something. Is there a plan that uh, this CI system will be part of the mandatory flow of uh, uh There are some discussions, but not that clear. I mean, if you're involved in Quagga, feel free to raise your opinion there. I would love to. I think the challenge is a little bit how the whole thing is. So the initial part from the testing, I think it's quite well accepted that just from anyone posting a patch and if anyone else finds a bug, it's basically answers back to the emails that will look at it as normal people have to fix it. The same thing, if my automated replies say back it doesn't work, people normally accept that and it doesn't go in. If the full test, obviously that takes a bit longer, but I'm working with it whenever like there are new releases pushed out new things, some branches back collapsed in the master that I basically do a full test run and make sure it's clean. Yeah. Um, you're using Atlassian? I'm using Atlassian, yes. So does that store all the test results as well? It stores all the test results, yes. Okay. So you're using, uh, So yes, it stores all the information, I have it all there. Okay. No. Uh, how often do you see the, the inconsistent results of the test execution? Uh, so you talk about the compliance test. I would say there are about, I would guess around 2,000 tests in there and there may be about 20 of them which are frequently like inconsistent and it's frequently it's about a timing issue. Uh, there are some of the protocol features where it requires that after specific time intervals something happens and Quarka is sometimes not that great on doing that on the right time and it may take an extra second longer or a little bit faster and it's not correct. That's frequently some of the issues. Is this because, is this because of the scheduler issue of the underlying yeah, it may be also obviously I'm running it on virtual machines and that might be also because my hypervisor is quite a bit loaded with all these virtual machines or it could be part of there are some issues in there too. Thank you. Something we've noticed is that can be both a good thing and a bad thing because if your underlying scheduling, like your hypervisor is overloaded, then it may induce race conditions which actually expose a bug. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah. Did so. Did okay. You publish, did, did you publish uh, the scripts to get integration from Patchwork to Jenkins? Did you did you publish any of that? Is that 
Which is um, available for other projects. It's use? basically, I, well, I said like before, I'm not using Jenkins, I'm using Atlassian Bamboo, but all that stuff, so I think that's more or less all public in some of our Git, if you go on our Git server. If not, let me know, and that's my mistake, but it should be basically somewhere there. I may not have it publicly announced where it is or something, but it should be if you go to git.net dev with f again, not with v, dot org, then you should be able to find most of it there. Okay. Okay. I think no more questions. I'm done.